Good morning. Good morning. We wish to say welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us both online and in person as we broadcast to the World Wide Web. My name is Ernest. We're glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, we're going to start a few minutes early because everybody's here and we will have some more people join us because it's the Philippines and five minutes early is 35 minutes early in some places. We are glad that everyone is here. We hope that you enjoy our study of God's word. The title of the lesson this morning will continue with our stories of escapes. And today we will escape from Sodom and Gomorrah. In the meantime, let's open with a song. Good morning. Let us start by singing hymn number four to one. 421, love lifted me. 421. Let's sing. 421. Let's sing. 421. I am sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stayed within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. And me, when the hunting end. 82. God be the glory. To God be the glory. Let us sing. To God be the glory. Great things he had done. So love he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life on Atonement for sin and open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, to the Father, true Jesus, the Son, and give him the glory. Great things he had done to. Great things he had taught us. Great things he had done. And great our rejoicing, true Jesus. Jesus the Son, but you rare and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, true Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Bago tayo dumako sa ating panalangin, let us sing him number 708. Awitin natin number 708. At kumari po, let, let po tayo tumayo sa ating pag-awit. Let us all stand as preparation for our opening prayer. 708. Let's sing. Walking in sunlight, all of our journey, over the mountain, to the devil. 
Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praise. Jesus is mine. Shadow around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praise, and Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Time for time lang, let us pray. Our Almighty God, our Heavenly Father and Lord, we come before you, thanking you for this day, thanking you, thanking you, O Lord, for the opportunity that you've given to us. May your Lord be with us as we continue to sing and hymns and praises to you. May you continue to guide us as we once again open your Holy Bible, which serves as our guidance to where you have asked us to be commandment to us, O Lord. May you bless us, O Lord, bless the brethren here right now that are serving you. May you bless the brethren all around the world that continue to come before you, continue to sing praises, and continue to do your work. May you guide us, O Lord, during this day. May you keep us safe from harm, safe from the sickness that is outside. May you also guide and be with our brethren, our loved ones that have sickness, have problems, O oh Lord. May you continue to bless them, to continue to guide them. Also, O oh Lord, may each and us have the opportunity to reach the brethren that are not with us right now, the brethren that are sick, and the brethren that have problems. May you also bless the church and bless uh, the works of the church, O oh Lord, not only here, but also in other places in the Philippines, and also in other places of the world. May you also guide us, O oh Lord, that we may continue not to sin. May you guide us to walk the right and our way to you. May you forgive us, continue to cleanse us for the sins that we have committed to you and also to people around us. O oh Lord, this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can I put Isang bahagi ng ating pananambahan at isang bahagi ng ating pananalig sa ating Panginoong Diyos ay ang banal na dulang na dito natin inaalala ang kamatay ng ating Panginoon na naghirap at kamatay si Cruz para sa ating kaligtasan. Number 12, awitin po natin. Number 12, bago po tayo tumakas sa banal. 
Alas, indeed, my Savior. Let us sing the first, the third, and the fifth stanza. First, third, and fifth. Lamang po ngating awi. Number 12. Let's sing. Hearts of grief can we repay the death of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Mga kapatid, tayo dadako sa bananadulang na dito natin inaalala kamatay natin Panginoon at ating Diyos na si Jesus na hindi ka rin buhay para sa atin. Nasarap natin ngayon ng tinapay na walang libadura na kawangis ng katawan at ang katas ng ibas na kawangis ng kanyang dugo. Tayo po ay manalangin para sa tinapay. Ngayon mo ko na tayo manalangin. Nakila at mga kapangyayang Diyos kami ang mga nagpapasalamat sa pagkakato na ito na pinagsama-sama mo kami upang patuloy alahanin, isipin ang nangyari sa aming Panginoong Jesus na naghirap para sa aming kalitasan. Nakilang ama, nasarap namin ngayon ang tinapay na walang libura na sumisimbolo sa kanyang katawan na nabayubay sa krus. Basbasin niyo nawa ito at ang bawat isa natatanggap. Ito ang may dadalangin namin sa ngala na aming tagapagligtas na si Jesus. Amen. Tayo naman manalangin para sa kras ng ubas. Tayo ang pagtayo manalangin. Nakilang Ama, papasalamat kami sa araw na ito at ang pag-ibig na patuloy niyong binibigay sa amin. Yung nakilang pag-ibig Ama na ibigay niyong yung buktong na anak na si Kristo Jesus na namatay para, para sa aming katubos, sa aming kasalanan. Nakilang Ama, ngayon ay nasarap namin ang kras ng ubas na simbolo sa kanyang dugo na bumuhos sa budok ng Kalbaryo. Nakilama, dalangin namin na basbasan ninyo ito. At linisin mo kami sa aming mga kasalanan. Patuloy niyong kami linisin naman. Ito ama, dinadalangin namin sa pagitan ng nakilang anak at aming tagapagligtas na si Jesus. Amen.
Hiwalay po sa banal na dulang, sa panunod sa atin, ang pagkakalob at pag-aambagan na ito ginagawa natin upang tulungan ang iglesia ng ating Panginoon sa ano ito. Ay manalang para sa pagkakalob. Diyos namin dakila at mga Panginoon. Diyos namin magpapala sa lahat. Kami ama nagpapasalamat sa iyong gabay. Mubay sa amin. Papasalamat kami sa iyong mga biyaya na pinagkakalob sa amin araw-araw. Dakila ma, muli ang iyong mga likod ay magbibigay ng salapi na isa tabi nila upang makatulong sa gawain ng iyong banal na iglesia. Patuloy aming nadalangin na patuloy mo kaming pagpalain, patuloy mo kaming tulungan sa aming mga pamumuhay. Alam namin na galing sa iyo lahat ng mga biyaya tulad ng mga trabaho o mga likosyo na ginagawa namin. Dakila ma, nawa ay gamitin namin sa liping ito, lamang sa iyong managawain, sa makatulong sa mga kapatid namin, mga tao na ang nailangan. Patuloy ama, ang paglapit namin sa iyo, at patuloy aming panalangin sa ngala namin Panginoon at nagpagliktas ni Jesus. Amen. Thank you, brother. Tayo nga nagdadako sa pakikinig ng mensahe ng Panginoon sa panguna ng kapatid Ernest. Awitin natin number 632. 632. At hinanda natin mga sarili sa ating pakikinig. The gospel is for all. Awitin ko na. 632. Let us sing. Of one the Lord has made the race, true one has come the fall, where sin has God must go His grace, the gospel is for all. The
Good morning. And if you speak Tagalog, magandang na lahat ng kapatid. We are glad that all of you are here. We are glad if you are here with us live. We are glad if you are here joining us online from somewhere not close by. And we are glad even if you're joining us online from someplace that is close by. It's nice to look around this morning and see all the faces. Some old faces we haven't seen in a while. Some new faces we haven't seen before. And unfortunately this morning we have some regular faces that just aren't here. Yet. But that happens, right? We wish to say thanks to all of you. Um, we have started a series of lessons called The Great Escapes of the Bible. And the escape that is paralleled for each of us is an escape from sin. It's an escape from a sinful life that leads us to the reward of that sinful life and towards a reward that comes from a Christian life. Today's lesson is the story of escape from Sodom and Gomorrah. And this morning, we're going to take a look at the lesson that is there, and we're going to look at some key points. Point number one is going to be that there was a revelation. Point number two, there was a negotiation. Point number three, there was a confrontation. And point number four, there was a destruction. You and I, we need to understand God's perspective when it comes to our need to escape sin. So open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 16. Put a bookmark there. We're going to take some road trips, but we'll come back. Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him. After him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. The salvation that is promised to us through Christ is not equal to the kingdom that was promised to Abraham. But God is faithful and true, and we will receive our promises. Verse 20, then the Lord said, <coughs> The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous. Now, let's talk for a moment. When I say Sodom and Gomorrah, everybody's familiar with the story from your Bible class, right? What most people do not realize is Sodom and Gomorrah were only two of the five cities that were destroyed. They also included the city of Adma, Zeboim, and Zaor. So there were a total of five cities that were destroyed. Now, when you talk to people who are biblical skeptics who do not want to accept the word of God, they're going to tell you, where is Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, I have a little story to tell you from Scientific American. According to Scientific American, the excavation from what is known as El Hammam, an archaeological site in Jordan, the same place that many people think was Sodom. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah are mentioned in the Bible. We just read it, right? 
Did you know that they are also mentioned in the Torah and the Quran? And they are. The city, the cities of sin that were destroyed by fire and brimstone sent from the heavens. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Philip J. Silva, who's an ar archeological professor from Southwest University located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he says, and I quote, samples from the site show extremely hot, explosive event leveled an area almost 200 square miles, including Middle Gore, which is a circular plain to the north of the Dead Sea. Now, when I say to you, Dead Sea, what do you think grows there? Not a lot, right? In fact, the destruction was so complete that it took almost 600 years before anybody lived in the area again. It wiped out 100% of the middle Bronze Age cities and towns, but it also stripped the agricultural soils from what, was, what, what were once fertile fields. That's science for those who are biblical skeptics about the text. Now, if you pay attention, you will notice that the Lord appeared to Abraham at his home. Abraham, being the man that he was, was quick to offer hospitality to the visitors. These angels announced to Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son at the appointed time. Sarah's 90 years old. Would you like to guess what her reaction was? She thought that was a bad joke. In fact, she got in trouble for that, but that's a different lesson for another day. Abraham kept company with these people for a while because angelos, when I say the word angel, it frequently appears in your mind a 10 foot tall flash glowing white beast with wings, right? Well, angel, the English word comes from the Greek word angelos and it means messenger. And as we read through the Bible from Genesis through Revelations, we will find that most of the time, people had no idea, which means the messengers from God, we don't know when we're speaking to them most of the time. Now, let's talk about Sodom and Gomorrah a little bit. These ancient cities were located in the valley by the Dead Sea. The area around here, Dead Sea, you, we know what grows there now, not much, was once green and lush. You're in Genesis chapter 17. Go to the left. Let's go take a look at Genesis chapter 13. Lot looked around, Genesis 13 and 10, Lot looked around and saw the whole plain of the Jordan towards the Or was well watered like a garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. This of course was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. However, the cities had a major problem with morality. They had a major problem with living the way that God told them. We're supposed to each live as God wants us to. Now let's take a look at what we find in Genesis chapter 18 related to these cities. Genesis 18, chapter, chapter 18 and verse 16 and following. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Os, Sodom and Abraham walked with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? 
Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him <coughs> that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Eight God in the New Testament, Abraham is referred to as a friend of God. It's also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, where he is called a friend of God. James chapter 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. God loved Abraham and blessed him with becoming a great nation. We saw that in verse 18. God also knew that Abraham would be faithful to his word, verse 19. So God wanted to reveal to Abraham the future for Sodom and Gomorrah. So what is the reputation of Sodom and Gomorrah? The evil of Sodom and Gomorrah was widely known. What about you? What about me? What about us? What is our reputation? Are we loving and kind or are we something else? Are we people of God or are we something else? Genesis chapter 13 verse 13 tells us, now the wicked, the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Here, God tells us that even the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah was grievous or infamous. So in the kingdom of God, are you famous or are you infamous? I don't know. That's between you and God. God's plan was to go down to the city and to see the truth. Now, we learned some things regarding our reputation. Go to Proverbs 22 and 1, please. Proverbs 22, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. I think most people in our society miss this. It's great to have a good reputation. However, God's word also tells us that a little foolishness can ruin a good reputation. Ecclesiastes 10 and 1, I'll get it. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. By the way, I have a room mostly of women. Ladies, if you like perfume, raise your hand. Do you like perfume? Expensive perfume too, right? Okay. Now, if I fill that bottle about half full of dead flies, are you going to put it on? No. 
So why would you have your reputation soiled by foolishness? Don't do it. God knew Sodom and Gomorrah's reputation. What does he think of ours? What does he think of mine? What does he think of your reputation? We're still in the book of Genesis. Go to chapter 18. Let's pick up in verse 23. Because there's a negotiation about to take place. Genesis chapter 18, verse 23. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous? Do we live in a culture that is seeking God? No. Does God continue to allow this culture to live so that the righteous can benefit also? I think yes. That's what the scriptures are telling us here. If we go down to verse 25, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the wicked and the righteous alike, far be it from you. It's not what God's plan is. God wants all of us to have an eternity in heaven, but he will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So maybe we are just the salt keeping the society preserved. Abraham sought to have these cities spared. Why? Well, Abraham knew the reputation of Sodom and Gomorrah. He also knew that he had a nephew named Lot who lived there. Now, Abraham wanted Lot to be spared from this condemnation, from the destruction. So he began this negotiation with God, what about the righteous amongst the wicked? Abraham knew that God would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Abraham asked if the city would be spared <coughs> for 50 righteous people. <coughs> the Lord agreed. So then the number became 45. And then it became 40, and then it became 30, and then it became 20, and finally it was settled on 10. If that number could be found, the city would not be destroyed. We know that God will always do what is right. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Second Peter chapter three, verse nine, please. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So when a skeptic asks you, why did God create hell? For men. And then they try to justify their sin. Well, it's not really that big a deal that I'm having an affair. It's not really that big a deal that I'm fill in the blank. God wants everyone, that's you, that's me, that's all of us, that's everybody who's here, that's everybody who's not here, that's everybody who won't even post and tell us that they're here. 
God wants all of us to come to repentance. Go to Psalm 98 and 9, please. Psalm 98, verse 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Pay attention to this next part. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people with equity, which, by the way, that word means equality. He doesn't favor some people over others. We also learn that he is the judge of the world. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 tells us, for we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, rather good or bad, you will receive your recompense. Going back to Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, picking up with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside for your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast or unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. He said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We will treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. Now there's some things for us to draw out from what we just read. The angels of the Lord meet Lot. He's sitting at the gate. He greeted them with hospitality. He fed them and he offered them shelter or a room for the night. He baked unleavened bread for them. By the way, unleavened bread was a quick bread to make. So it means they were in a hurry. And unleavened bread 
later on will become a major part of the tradition of the Jewish people, and it is still today part of Christianity, as during the Exodus. This bread has special significance for the children of Israel, as Moses told them the story. The angels of the Lord met the men of Sodom. The text says that both young and old from every quarter came to Lot's house. Think of a big riot in front of your front door. They decided that what they wanted to do was sodomize these men in a gang rape fashion. Lot told them, don't do this thing. Don't behave like this. Lot offered them his own daughters, verse eight. He seems to have already known what their response would be. They accused Lot of judging them. And was he judging them? Any time you do right, while most of the people around you are doing wrong, your behavior is judging them. Not that you're pronouncing it, but if you're, if everybody at work is taking food, let's say you work in a restaurant and other people, you're supposed to have one meal a day, but everybody's taking two instead and you don't, hey, the rules say just one. Are you judging the people? You're not saying anything. You're just behaving in a way that brings honor to your employer and to yourself. I don't know that he spoke any judgment on them, but I know that his admiral behavior caused their less than admiral behavior to be drawn out and looked at. Now they began to push back or press on Lot and break down the door of his house. So the angels opened the door and pulled Lot inside. And the angels struck these men with blindness. What a contrast between Lot and the other men of the city. The righteous seek to give to others. The wicked only want to take. The righteous seek to build up other people to help them be everything they can. The wicked only seek to destroy. The righteous seek to protect people. The wicked seek to attack. The righteous seek to do good for other people. The wicked only desire wickedness. The righteous judge correctly and the wicked condemn all judgment. Judgment between what is right and what is wrong often implies condemnation of those that are doing wrong. Jesus told us that his words would do this judgment. Go to John chapter 12, verse 48, please. John chapter 12, verse 48. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day. Don't go there. Proverbs 15, 10 tells us stern discipline awaits anyone who leaves the path. The one who hates correction will die. Lot made a judgment, not that he announced it, but he was condemned by the wicked for doing good. So what about sin? First John chapter three tells us if you say you are without sin, you are a liar and the truth is not in you. 
Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. God most definitely has judgment for immoral behavior. However, let's talk about people, people today around us, always. So let's go down the list. Sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men that have sex with men, thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. None of these people are going to heaven if you haven't repented of your behavior. But let's talk some reality. I'm only a chesmoso. He's a thief. I'm better than him. I'm only having sex with a woman I'm not married to. He's having sex with another man. Therefore, I'm better than him. I'm a swindler, but he's a thief. You know what, folks? There most definitely is a difference in sin, but I'm not at all sure that I want to be standing on the righteous stone, lest I get the same answer that I get that Jesus Christ gave those to the woman who was caught in adultery. You who is without sin, cast the first stone. Are you guilty of sin? I know that I am. Live better. Do the way things that God wants you to do. God's standard for what makes moral behavior has not changed. Go back to Genesis chapter 19. Let's pick up in verse 12. The two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? sons-in-laws or sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place the outcry to the lord against its people is so great he has sent us to destroy it verse 14 so Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. Let's pay attention to what happens. But his sons-in-laws thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hands and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, no, my lords, 
please. Your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me. It's 200 miles away. I can't run that far. Look, verse 20, here is a town near enough to run to. It is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared, he said to them. Very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town is called Zor. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. From the Lord out of the heavens, thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Lot's wife. We're going to talk about her in verse 26. However, when you leave the world, when you decide to follow Christ, don't look back. Keep going. That's not what Lot's wife is getting ready to do. Verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot was living. So what about the pronouncement of the angels? They told Lot to gather his family and leave. Why? Because the city was going to be destroyed. Why was the city destroyed? Because it was wicked. Lot escaped. But when Lot spoke to his sons-in-laws, they thought he was joking. They evidently didn't want to leave. Life is comfortable here. I have a nice house and I like it here and I'm not going to run away. Bet you wish you did now. When the morning came, the angels once again encouraged Lot to leave. Get out of here. They finally laid their hands on him to get him and his family out of the city. The text says that in doing this, God was being merciful to them. He set them outside the city and told them to flee to the mountains and to not go back. But Lot said, the mountains are too far away. I can't run that far. Lot asked to escape to Zaor, a small city instead, and it was allowed. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. In verse 24 and 25, it tells us the destruction was by fire and brimstone. In verse 26, Lot's life, wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. 27 through 29 tell us Abraham's perspective on this destruction. It looked like a furnace. Verse 29 tells us that God remembered Abraham by sparing Lot. Okay, so what can we learn? God expects us to not delay when we are trying to escape sin. Go to Acts chapter 16, verse 33. Acts chapter 16, verse 33. 
This is the middle of the night, 2 a.m. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all of his household were baptized. When? That day, at that hour, at 2 a.m. today. When you get ready to turn your back on sin, do it. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning, call me. We'll figure it out. You're in Acts chapter 16. Go to the right to Acts chapter 22. And ask yourself the question that Ananias is about to ask Paul. And now, what are you in verse 16? And now, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. God's mercy is not the same thing as our comfort. God's mercy is not the same thing as our comfort. We serve God. He tells us what we're supposed to do. Go one book to the right, to the left of the book of Matthew. It's the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Some things we need to know. Let us remember the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. There was a revelation. God revealed to Abraham what was going to happen. There was a negotiation where Abraham negotiated for the sparing of the cities. There was a confrontation between the angels or messengers of God and the sinful men of the city. And then there was a destruction that came at the end. You know, the same thing happens to a lot of people when they think about becoming a Christian. Well, okay, I need to be a Christian, but how about we wait until the second Tuesday of next week? How about we wait until it's my birthday? How about we wait... The instructions, if we go back to the scriptures we just read in the book of Acts, are what are you waiting for? Do it now. There's a confrontation. When the evil in your life and the holiness of God come together, what something has to give. And if you choose not to give, then there is destruction. The destruction that comes with an eternity spent in fire and brimstone. Look, I know most of you, I don't know everybody that's online, and I love all of you. If there's anybody here, by the way, I've been asked this question, so I'm gonna to need to clarify it. I do not have the authority to forgive sins. That belongs only to God. So when I tell you that if you are in need of public repentance, that means if you've done something everybody knows about, your repentance needs to be as public as your sin. If it's between you and God, leave it between you and God. If you are a Christian who's fallen back in love with the ways of the world and you need prayer for repentance, come and we will offer that prayer. If you're a Christian and you are in need of prayers about family, about the troubles of life, about the problems that we often find ourselves surrounded by, come have a seat and we will say that prayer for you today. And if you have never put on Jesus Christ through the act of baptism for the remission of your sins, you come have a seat and this hour we will take care of that. In the meantime, Everybody else, stand up and sing that invitation song.
Number five, zero. Are you washing the blood? Let us sing the first, the second, and the fourth stanza. First, second, and fourth. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing Let us sing. Have you been to Jesus for your cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest this moment in the crucified? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you washing the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood in the soul? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Join me in prayer, please. God, we come before you this morning thanking you for the saving power of Jesus Christ. Thanking you, God, for the opportunity to have all of our sins forgiven. Thanking you, Lord, for the love that we share with each other. God, we have some heaviness on our heart this morning. We ask, Lord, that you look after Sister Glendy and help her return to her physical well-being. And Lord, we also ask for the family of Senior Chief Gunner's mate, Howard Jade Berry, friend of mine. He passed recently, and we ask that his family be granted peace as they move forward without him here to guide them. Grant us strength, God. Help us each to be your salt and light to the world. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>